Welcome to Chapter 1, Introduction to the Earth. We're going to look at the Earth as a whole and get some of the major concepts of geography through all the way until we get to something called the Earth-Sun relationship. The basic concepts of this chapter include the science of geography. We're going to define what a system is and how that is influenced by the Earth systems concept, how to locate things on Earth using latitude and longitude, time on Earth, which is linked to longitude, the solar system, the sun, and then finally, the seasons. Key terms in this chapter include latitude and longitude and parallel and meridian, which are linked to latitude and longitude. Then we're going to get into the link between longitude and time zones. We're going to step back and look at a big picture of our solar system and get into solar wind, the seasons, and with the seasons, look into rotation, revolution, and axial parallelism. Those are fancy words for pretty basic concepts. To really understand the seasons, in terms of the Earth and Sun relationship, we're going to get into subsolar point and the circle of illumination. Before we talk about geography, we need to talk about the scientific method. Geography is one of the very first sciences. It's been around for about two millennia. But with any science out there, the method that we usually use is that we observe phenomena and form some kind of idea of what's going on, which is called a hypothesis. But then we have to experiment, and we carefully design this experiment to test the hypothesis. We predict the outcome of this experiment, conduct the experiment, and then draw conclusions. Basically, if we can repeat the experiment multiple times, then we can have a solid conclusion which may lead to a theory. And if the theory continues to be um, provable, maybe a law. Theories, though, are always developed through method review. And there's always some aspect of uncertainty with the theory. Within this course, we're going to look at the physical Earth in terms of earth systems sciences. And so we got to step back and look into what a system is. Basically, a system is a set of interacting or interdependent components that form an integrated whole. I kind of like to think of systems as something that is organized and it's unique compared to any other type of system out there. An everyday example would include a car. A car has a very organized way of taking in energy and material. We usually give it gas, we have to give it money and tires and brakes every once in a while. And then it outputs specific material as well. Unfortunately, some of that is greenhouse gases. But it's very unique. Uh, a more natural way of looking at it is a leaf. A leaf here is a very unique system. It takes in carbon dioxide, sunlight, and water, and expels more water and oxygen. And you will never find a system quite like a leaf. Can you think of other examples of systems? So Earth can be divided into major systems itself, and sometimes we call these systems spheres. All of these spheres are what we consider open spheres or open systems. They rely on other entities, whether it's matter or energy, outside of that system. And with the Earth, all of these systems are interconnected. We have the atmosphere, which is basically a mixture of gases. We have the hydrosphere, which is water and ice. So up here we have a glacier, and down here we have water in the form of a lake. We have the lithosphere, which includes rocks and minerals. And later on in, the, in this course, 
we're going to link the lithosphere to earthquakes and volcanoes. And something that is shared in all of the systems is the biosphere, which is the life part of the Earth. So what is the Earth and what, what's its shape? So many of you know that the Earth is round, but maybe you don't quite know that the Earth is really not a perfect sphere. For example, if we took a car and we drove from the North Pole all the way around the South Pole back to the North Pole, the circumference or that distance is 24,860 miles. However, if you drove around the equator which is right around here, all the way around, that distance would only be 24,902 miles. So actually that distance is greater than the distance around the poles. That means the Earth is slightly flat, and we call that bulge a geoidal bulge. Any idea what causes that bulge? The answer is centrifugal force. Because remember, the Earth is rotating around the North and South Pole. And so centrifugal force is forcing a bit of the Earth around the equator to bulge outward. Many of you may, maybe you have heard of latitude and longitude, but you don't quite know the details of them. So in order to locate anything on Earth, we need to know exactly two pieces of information, the latitude and the longitude. Before we get into that, just remember that if you use a GPS device in the background, it's using latitude and longitude. And one of the probably the most common ways that you locate things is using an address. So your house has an address, your favorite restaurant has an address, your school has an address. But what if you're talking about the peak of a mountain? That doesn't have an address. So we need to have a system for locating things. The first half or part of that system is called latitude. Essentially, latitude is a way of showing how far north you are or how far south you are from the equator. And your measurements are in degrees. So the equator is zero degrees all the way up to the North Pole, which is 90 degrees, and I'm gonna put in here north, 90 degrees north. If you were in the Southern Hemisphere, you would go all the way down to 90 degrees south. Another name for lines of latitude, by the way, lines of latitude run east and west. So another name for them is parallels. A parallel is a line of latitude. And the reason it's, it's called a parallel is because it all lines of latitude are parallel to each other. As you get up to the North Pole, then it's just a dot. We're going to get into important latitudes later on when we talk about the seasons, but as, as a reminder for now, there are seven very important latitudes. We just talked about the equator. We talked about the North Pole, and we talked about the South Pole. So I'll get into this later, but another four sets of latitudes that are important is the Arctic Circle, the Tropic of Cancer, the Tropic of Capricorn, and the Antarctic Circle. With latitude, we tend to look into latitudinal geographic zones. It's a general way to locate things on Earth. For example, you may have heard of the tropics. Anytime you're talking about the tropics, you're talking about areas in between 23 and a half degrees north to 23 and a half degrees south. If you're talking about places close to where we live, most of the United States is included in the mid-latitude region. The North Pole is included in the Arctic region. And so we'll talk more about this as we go forward, and especially when we talk about climate. So if latitude measures distance, distances north and south of the equator, 
what do you think longitude does? Longitude measures distances east and west. But east and west of what? Well, it's a little bit more difficult to figure out a starting point, we'll say. But back, we'll say 100, 200 years ago, we finally have developed an arbitrary but permanent, for now, place where we can put our zero line for longitude. And that's called the prime meridian. It goes right through Greenwich, England, which I'll show pictures of a little bit here. And essentially, distances east of that is east longitude, and, area and distances west of that is west longitude. Another term for lines of longitude is a meridian, just like the prime meridian. Now, we can't call these parallel, parallel lines, because look, look what happens. As you go farther north, these lines, all these longitude lines, start to converge at the poles. So that's one major difference between lines of latitude and lines of longitude. So to put this all together, we have our geographic grid. And there are two ways we can write out latitude and longitude values. Now we can't just say, for example, the latitude in whole numbers, okay, in numbers of degrees, for Pierce College is 34 degrees. And the longitude, oh, I should say 34 degrees north. And then the longitude for Pierce College is 118 degrees west. Now that doesn't give us a, a very precise location because distances between each long, or I should say between each latitude can be around 69 miles. So that doesn't really give us a lot of precision. But we can get more precise by using degrees, minutes, and seconds. So in terms of the range of numbers, for latitude, the degrees go from 0 to 90, minutes go from 0 to 60, just like minutes on a clock, and seconds go from 0 to 60, just like seconds on a clock. Now, don't get confused. Minutes here, in this case, is a distance. It's not time. It's just like seconds. And then you have to put either north or south. Unless it's the equator, then you just put 0. You don't have to put anything else. Then we have longitude. Now longitude values go from 0 to, zero to 180. Minutes, just like before, 0 to 60, seconds 0 to 60. Then you put east or west. Unless you're at the prime meridian, then you don't have to put anything. So for example, I have 60 degrees. 30 minutes, 34 seconds north, 160 degrees, 43 minutes, 32 seconds east. That's very precise. If you wanted to be even more precise, you could put a decimal point after the seconds. There, the other kind is called decimal degrees. Now decimal degrees, it's a little bit easier. You just have degrees, but with a decimal. And you can have many decimal places if you want, but you still have to remember with latitude to put a north or a south, unless it's the equator. Longitude, 0 to 180 with a decimal, east or west, unless you're at the prime meridian. So in this example, I have converted this right up here to down here. So down here, I have 60 and a half degrees north, 160.72 degrees east. In one of your homework assignments, you will have to use one of these systems for latitude and longitude. It's up to you if you want to use degrees, minutes, and seconds, or decimal degrees. Whoa. All right. so. When we get it, before we get into time, what we need to do is we need to look at how the Earth rotates. If we're looking over the North Pole, and by the way, a pole is are two points, the North Pole and the South Pole. 
that go through the Earth around the rotation of the Earth. And the axis is an imaginary straight line, it's an imaginary straight line that goes through the center of the Earth, about which or around which the Earth rotates. So looking over the North Pole, the Earth rotates counterclockwise. If we're looking on the side of the Earth, it rotates eastward. And as you know, it takes one day for the Earth to rotate, or 24 hours. So what that does is that gives us our standard time zones. And we have 24 standard time zones for each hour. And it's interesting to use one of these maps because it helps you understand the time in one place compared to the time, let's say, where you live. For example, it looks to me like there are eight time zones from Los Angeles to London, England. So if it's 4 a.m., if it's 4 a.m. in Los Angeles, what time is it in London? It is 12 noon. In your Geography 15 class, which is the lab class, if you end up taking this, you will have more experience in calculating and determining time zones. So because I'm a geography major and I love to travel, about, let's say, five or so years ago, I went to the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England, which is just east of London. And as you can see, this is this over here is a telescope where you can actually see parts of London. The heart of London is right here. This is Canary Wharf. This was taken back in 2012 for the Summer Olympics. There was a long line to stand on the prime meridian, which is what I wanted to do. So what I did is I just took a snapshot of my feet. And because I'm looking south, this part of the image is in the eastern hemisphere, east of the prime meridian, and this part here is in the western hemisphere, the hemisphere we live in, which is west of the prime meridian. Inside, it gives you the exact latitude and longitude coordinates. So the latitude here, you may not be able to see this, 51 degrees, 28 minutes, 38 seconds, north. And what do you think my longitude would be? It's exactly zero because we're standing right on the prime meridian. This is a plaque that was inside the observatory and it's great because it gives you another way to link time with longitude. And if you do the math, 360 degrees are in a circle, 24 hours are in a day, so that means each line of longitude, or I should say each time zone really, is about 15 degrees longitude. However, remember going back to that map, those lines of time zones are, are jagged, and that's due to political issues or, or changes due to political or other types of um, um, historical, we'll say, events. There was a time where it was very difficult to understand what the time would be out at sea. So this is another way of understanding the, the link between time and longitude. Okay, so we're going to switch gears here. We, we talked a little bit of, uh, we had a little bit of basics in, when it comes to the solar, or when it comes to the Earth. We're going to zoom out here and look at the solar system. And there's just a few things I want to point out with the solar system. First of all, the sun is in the center of the solar system, but it's not in the exact mathematical center. That's going to come into play in a little bit here when we talk about the seasons. Unfortunately, there are only eight planets in our solar system. Pluto is still not considered um, a planet, which it was when I was a very young kid. And Earth is the third planet from the sun. The sun actually spews out charged particles, and those charged particles make up what we call the solar wind. The solar wind can actually have disruptions of satellites, of our electricity, 
and telecommunication issues periodically. And sunspots are these spots that have large areas of solar wind activity. And these sunspots tend to have a cycle of about 11 years. By the way, this is a better view of the size of the Earth compared to the sun. I mean, just look at the emission of the sun and compare that emission, the solar wind, to the Earth. You can see that it's quite large. Of course, the Earth is about 93 million miles away, so that helps when it comes to uh, protecting ourselves from these very dangerous emissions of the sun. One thing that we have on the Earth that actually protects us is something called that magnetic shield. So we have these lines that emanate from the Earth, from the North and South Pole. And this blocks much of the solar wind. Now, some of these charged particles get down toward the middle part of our atmosphere in and around the North and South Pole, and it creates something called the northern or southern lights. Speaking of the sun and the North Pole, this picture here shows you the sun up at a specific time of the day near the North Pole. You might notice that it's at least in the cold area because we have chunks of ice in the sea. What time of the day do you think this picture was taken? If you guessed midnight, you are correct. Many of you would be like, wow, why is the sun up during midnight? That is the first step in understanding seasons and the Earth-Sun relationships. Before we get into that, just so you know, because the sun and the direct rays of the sun are more concentrated on the tropics compared to the poles, we have much more sunlight in the tropics. In fact, sometimes energy is two and a half times more than that of the poles, which makes sense because we know the tropics are much warmer on average than the polar regions. However, this direct sunlight changes location throughout the year, which is one of the biggest reasons why we have our astronomical seasons, fall, winter, spring, and summer. In order to understand that a little bit more, imagine a flashlight. A flashlight of a certain brightness is shining directly onto a table, and you can see how bright that is. If you take that same flashlight and angle it, see how much dimmer it is for these sections? Because that same amount of energy is being spread out over a much larger region. So high sun, or sun that we see around noontime, is much more direct. And this noontime sun is much more direct for the tropics than it is for the poles. And in the polar regions, or let's say we, we think about a, a sunset in or our noon, sun that's, a, that's setting or rising is near the horizon, and therefore that light is spread out much more than the light that is emanating from the top of the sky. So keep that in mind. What is a season, by the way? I mean, we live in California, and many people would not, ex would not think that we have seasons. But maybe we do have seasons, so how would you describe a season, even California seasons? Well, I like to think of seasons as a certain part of a year that has certain types of weather. Now, where I grew up near Chicago, we had your traditional fall, winter, spring, and summer seasons. We had snow in the winter, we had you know, trees, um, budding with life in the spring, we had warm summers, and then we had cooler weather in the fall with leaves falling off the trees. In California, we have muddled seasons, but just keep in mind that when we talk about seasons in terms of the earth and the sun, we're talking about astronomical seasons. We, we talk about our four traditional seasons. What causes seasons then? 
Well, I'm going to list here five different reasons for seasons. Revolution, rotation, the tilt of the Earth's axis, axial parallelism, and sphericity. We're going to go through each of these to quite or to understand a little bit more about how these play a role in changing the weather throughout the year. Rotation and revolution are relatively straightforward. Sphericity just means that the Earth is a sphere. And so that changes the direct the um, the amount of direct sunlight a place would get. So the two that are a little bit more difficult and we're going to look into these and I have videos posted as well on Canvas. We're going to get into these more a little, little bit later. So keep in mind that revolution is the journey around the sun. So the Earth is revolving around the sun. And as you can see, the sun is not exactly in the center. Take a look at this. On January 3rd, we are 91.4 million miles away from the sun. However, on July 4th, we are 94.5 million miles away from the sun. So we are actually farther away from the sun during summer than we are during the winter. And you're probably like, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. So even though the revolution plays a role in the seasons, the distance of the Earth from the sun may confuse you because even though we are closer to the Earth in January, the Northern Hemisphere experiences winter. So something else must be happening to be causing warmer weather in the summer, or at least our summer. Because remember, when, North Amer or when the Northern Hemisphere has summer, the Southern Hemisphere has winter. We also have the Earth rotating. So this slide here is just to help you understand the difference or let you remember the difference between revolution and rotation. Revolution is the journey of the Earth around the sun and rotation is the spin of the Earth that takes 24 hours. Probably the two most important reasons why we have seasons is the axial tilt and the parallelism. So if you ever look at a globe, a good globe, you will notice that the Earth, it, the Earth, or, or at least the North Pole, it does not go straight up and down. In fact, the North Pole should be angled a bit. So if you have one lying around a house, go ahead and take a look and see what you see. The angle between the line that would go straight up and down and the North Pole is 23 and a half degrees. That means the Earth is tilted this amount. Also, the North Pole, no matter what time of year, is pointed toward the same part of the sky. And that part of the sky is the North Star, or Polaris. So those two work together to provide more energy for the Northern Hemisphere's summer and less energy for the Northern Hemisphere's winter. So let's take a look at this a little bit more. So remember, I'm going to list here the five big reasons why we have seasons. I'm also going to list out a couple of terms. We have the subsolar point. That's just the point on the Earth where the sun is directly overhead at noon. And that changes throughout the year. And then we also have something called the circle of illumination. It's just basically where the sunrise and sunset is. It separates the day hemisphere from the night hemisphere. Let's go ahead and start with June. June is the beginning of summer. Notice that the northern hemisphere is pointed toward the sun. So more of that energy, more of the sun's energy is in the northern hemisphere compared to the southern hemisphere. And we'll get into the subsolar point a little bit later. On the flip side, the December solstice, now the northern hemisphere is darker or pointed away from the sun. So the, the southern hemisphere has the summer and the northern hemisphere has the winter. Now the equinoxes 
the, the direct sunlight is right at the equator, right at the equator. So that's the beginning of spring and then the beginning of fall for September. So let's get into this in a little bit more detail. So we're going to get into the four seasons. The summer solstice it occurs on June 21st. The subsolar point is 23 and a half degrees north, which is right about where Cabo San Lucas is. It goes pretty much through Mexico, northern Africa, parts of Asia. By the way, California is too far north. We never, ever experience direct sunlight. If it's June 21st, beginning of summer, you go outside and you look straight up, you will not see the sun directly above you in California. Also, day length increases from the equator to the North Pole. So all the way up until you have a 24 hour day in and around the North Pole. Remember that picture where we saw the sun at midnight? That's because the, the areas north of 66 and a half degrees north, which is a which is a very important latitude, is constantly in the sun. Then we have the winter solstice, the opposite. Starts on December 22nd. Subsolar point is 23 and a half degrees south, and day length increases from the equator down to the South Pole. So this is when you'd want to visit Antarctica because it would be daylight in parts of Antarctica for up to six months. And then we have the equinoxes, right in the middle, March 21st, September 23rd. Subsolar point is right at the equator. Notice when I listed the latitude for equator, it's zero, not zero north or zero south. Circle of illumination passes through both poles and during the equinoxes, everywhere on Earth has exactly 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night. Pretty cool. So going back to those very important latitudes, the Tropic of Cancer, 23 and a half degrees north, is the farthest direct sunlight or the subsolar point will go, the farthest north. The Tropic of Capricorn is the farthest south where the subsolar point or direct sunlight will go. So anywhere in the tropics you get direct sunlight, which is why it's so warm there. If you don't live within these these two areas, you will never have direct sunlight. The Arctic Circle is the, the point where if you go, let's fast forward into summer, areas north of the Arctic Circle will have a 24 hour day, but in the winter time, it'll have a 24 hour night. Antarctic Circle, the same thing, but for the Southern Hemisphere and for its seasons. So here's another way of looking at where the subsolar point is. We have the subsolar point for the Tropic of Cancer during the Northern Hemisphere's summer solstice, and we have the subsolar point for the Tropic of Capricorn, which is the Southern Hemisphere's summer or our winter solstice. You can also see where we have a 24-hour night, 24-hour day, etc. for both hemispheres. At the equinox, the direct sunlight's right at the equator, and everywhere on Earth has a 12-hour day and a 12-hour night. And finally, one of the ways that we can tell that we actually have seasons is by looking at how high the sun is at noon. I don't know if you've noticed, but when it's around December, in December and January, the noon sun is not very high in the sky, even in California. But in the summer, it gets very high in the sky. It doesn't get up to 90 degrees. We don't have direct sunlight, but it can get quite high. And we notice that the shadows of things are quite short versus in the winter where the shadows can be quite long.